saving investment starts with these two terms of income and expenditure. And when we examine income and expenditure, for anybody advising on investment or for anybody doing comprehensive financial planning, income and expenditure figures are a basic building block. Now, when you're with an uh, experienced investment advisor, because of the person's uh, experience, because of the confidence, the expertise that is very obvious in an experienced advisor, a lot of people easily divulge information. In other cases, you may hesitate to give out information about your uh, monthly income especially. Don't hesitate to do so because just as you would confide in a lawyer, a doctor, about your actual problems. No investment advisor is ever bothered about how much you're earning for any purpose other than helping you become more effective in your own investments. So these are the basic building blocks, the income and expenditure. When we talk about income, it is good to focus on something called the net income. What do I mean by net? In the context of a salary earner, you will have a certain gross income, there will be certain deductions for towards employees, provident fund, other benefits. There can also be taxes to be paid, income tax to be paid. It is good to inform a financial planner or an investment advisor about the net figure, that is income after deductions, after taxation. If you slightly want to understate your income, I'm getting 60,000 a month, after deductions it's 53,000, I want to say 50,000, fine. When you come to the expenditure side, many of us are not aware of how much we need to live normally per month, normal uh, living expenses. Doesn't matter if this is not calculated very accurately, but a financial planner needs a starting point. Later on, if you think that I told him 30,000, but actually it's 37,000, no problem, you can change it. A financial plan can be reworked. But the starting point is important. And these kind of figures, these kind of plans, in the context of a married couple, it is much better that both husband and wife are involved in the finances. Very often, the first question I ask when a totally new person has come for financial planning is, are you married? If so, where is your spouse? I would like both of you to come for the financial planning session, for the investment advising session. Both of you know what's happening. I do a lot of advising to people I do not meet, I do not see. There are people who have been dealing with me 20 years, United States, other places, they have never come to India. I always ask, do you share your email ID? Is there a different email ID for husband and wife? If there is, my replies will go to both of them. So everybody is aware of what is happening. And the most effective investment plans, believe me, are plans where both husband and wife work on them together. This is important. And finally, of course, for me to help you or for your investment advisor to help you, the presumption is that our income is a little more than our expenditure. If it's the other way around, then there is no investment planning, there is expenditure control. Okay, this is what we have to work on first, chip away at it so that there is something left at the end of the month which an investment advisor can help you with. One more thing is, this is important, it sounds good, but it's important. We have to change the way we look at income, expenditure and saving. <laughs> this is very important. We have to change this because this is the normal equation. We earn an income, we have our expenditure, what remains is savings. We must change this to income minus savings must be expenses.
This is a very, very important. It is like tax deducted at source. You have no control over it. You must change this. Only here it becomes effective. I have come across young graduates, BCom, they did nothing fancy, BCom. They get an ordinary job in Bangalore somewhere, 20,000 rupees a month. I find them living just frugally, 12,000 rupees is the expense, people can save 8,000 rupees. But recently I had another young person, same kind of qualifications but very intelligent, very smart, wonderful personality. This person started out at close to 40,000 rupees a month because did very well in an interview, good company, mix of luck but also the person's um, inbuilt uh, qualities, was earning almost twice but not able to save six or seven thousand rupees a month. Why? Living life king size. So when I sat with this individual, the first thing that I did was, although there was a slight amount of six or seven thousand rupees that could be saved, the first thing that I did was ask questions about expenditure. And then I found there was a lot of careless expenditure, a lot of needless expenditure. And then I did my best to persuade the person to slowly raise the level, I mean sorry, curb the level of expenditure, thereby releasing some more money for investment. If we decide that I am earning 40,000 rupees, 15,000 rupees will go to saving. The moment the 40,000 comes into my bank account, 15,000 should be swiped away. It is as if mentally I am earning only 25,000. That 25,000 rupees, I am going to take care of my expenses for the next month. This kind of a change in equation where you give precedence to investment. There was a girl I taught about four or five years back in Mangalore. She then went on to do a hotel management, landed a very good job with the Taj group. And you see the attitude. She sends me an email. I was in your class. I want to do financial planning. I want to start saving. I remember what you said, that saving must start the moment we start working. I said, okay, I sent her a few questions to be answered. And one of the questions was income and expenditure. And then I get this reply. I have this income, but I have received nothing so far because I'm emailing you a fortnight before I've received my first salary. And when I receive my first salary also, I'm going to be on probation. But I sent her a very good email saying that you are one day going to be a very successful investor. Because you are thinking of planning, you are thinking of putting by something, you are thinking of progressing through life with effective investment even before you have earned your first rupee. That is a wonderful attitude to have. That is a wonderful attitude to have where personal investment is concerned. And she said she wants to do this. She is going to tell me how much is going to be taken out straight away. And she said, register my SIPs within three or four days of the salary being credited to my account. That date she knows. Why? She doesn't want the money to remain there. The money that has to go into investment should be swiped out immediately. The rest of the money remains, okay, now I know how much I need for my expense. I have to live within my means. I'm not recommending to anybody that you live like misers. Life is meant to be enjoyed. What I'm saying is that our enjoyment of life should not be at the cost of our investments. Because if it is at the cost of our investments, a day may come when we are no longer able to be productive. And at that time, it is our investments that have to work for us. For our investments to work for us, there should be investments. And those investments have to be built up during our economically productive phase of life. Another quality that a good investor must have should be persistence. So I want to talk about two concepts in this particular uh, reflection. One is persistence. The second is intelligent persistence.
Can we raise the level? Persistence in anything is a, is a good uh, quality to have. I don't give up. I will work at it. Let's look at somebody who's persistent and somebody who's advising about persistence. John Bogle is also a very fine financial writer. He is the virtual inventor of the low cost, no load index fund <laughs> for the normal retail investor. Index funds were there even from 80, 90 years. But this is the man who was able to, under a fund that he founded called Vanguard Mutual Fund in the United States, he was able to actually popularize the index fund at the retail level. What does John Bogle say? If you read this slide, it is like a one slide course in personal investment. He says, stay the course. No matter what happens, stick to your investment program. I have said stay the course a thousand times and I meant it every time. It is the most important single piece of investment wisdom I can give you. Read that last line again. It is the most important single piece of investment wisdom I can give you. You want only one piece of advice on investment? It is this. Stay the course. Continue your program. Do not stop it. Do not stop it. Markets are sentiment driven. Everybody is happy at 30,000. A genuine investor will not be happy at 30,000. A genuine investor wants the markets to fall. Only when they fall do I get invest, I mean, assets at cheaper prices. See how different this is from our attitude to life. In life, if you see a store there, if you see a board there, buy one, get one free or 50% discount, you will have to fight your way into the shop. Why? Something is available cheap. But in investment, everybody suffers from clinical depression when the index is 50% down. A 50% fall in the index is God's gift to the investor. Nobody realizes that. Newspapers will headline, capitalism is dying, the markets are going to close. This is the end of investing as we know it. That is the time when an investor should be happiest. But unfortunately, there are many behavioral aspects to markets and to investment. We should be very careful not to get trapped by behavior. That's important. So John Bogle says, stay the course. Market is up, you're there. Market is down, you're there. Market is somewhere in between, you're there. Whatever happens, do, no matter what happens, stick to your investment program. And if you want to be successful in investment, you do not have to have qualifications in finance and investment. You need to have persistence. This is what John Bogle said. Let's take a very simple investment. Somebody is investing 50,000 rupees into the public provident fund. But this person is doing it for 40 years. On a given day, 50,000 is put into the PPF. I have assumed we have seen 12% interest rate on the PPF. We have seen uh, it's come down to 8.6, 8.5. I have assumed just 8%. Just 8%. For 40 years, because 40 years is a normal person's working life span. You build up this amount. If you continue this, you do not withdraw at all. You start at 20, 21, 22. You continue till 60, 61, 62. Lot of people in India have retired off money in their PPF accounts. This is an example of persistence. Is it intelligent persistence? Let's take another example. Somebody told me that in the long run, the stock market is not only safe, it is going to give me a higher return than the PPF. At the same time, there may be some risks in the short term, first two, three, four, five years. So I do not want to shift everything to the stock market. I want to have something in PPF, something in the stock market. How to decide? When in doubt, 50-50. So 25,000 into maybe an equity fund or an index fund, 25,000 into the PPF for 40 years, I do not even rebalance. I just see that my, if I assume 14% return on the stock market, 8% in the PPF and an average of 11%, this is what I built up. Now my question is, from 1.4 crores 
to end at 3.23 crores, investing the same 50,000, but dividing it between the PPF and equity. For the difference in the end value, is the risk that I took worth it? This is the question that we should ask, or what the financial types call the risk adjusted return. But we'll not go by that jargon. What is the risk that I took? I put 25,000 into the PPF, that is safe, government guarantee. I put an equal amount into equity. Equity I didn't invest once in a lump sum. It was every year or maybe every month, 2,000 rupees or something like that. But it can make a very huge difference to your end corpus. In both, there were persistence. There was persistence in the PPF. There was persistence in this mix. Both invested for 40 years, the same amount. It can make a huge difference to an end corpus. This is what happens when you try to achieve some sort of asset allocation. And when 50% of your portfolio is not exposed to risk at all, only the other 50% is exposed to some risk. But understand the word risk can mean many things. A bank deposit can be risky if the real rate of return is negative. Look at what's happened in this country. Assume 10% return on the bank deposit for a senior citizen. Assume the senior citizen is just in the 10% bracket, so 10 minus 1 is 9, but the inflation rate was 10, you end up with minus 1. That is risk. That is risk. And of course, the next slide, it's not that I recommend it. I'll put it just because I always get this question when I conduct things like this. Can you show us what would have happened if we had put everything in equity, 50,000 rupees per year in equity for 40 years? <clears throat> Do I recommend this? For a normal investor, no. I will not depart from asset allocation. I will not depart from asset allocation. I will continue with asset allocation. But I am talking here about intelligent persistence. How do I sum up intelligent persistence? I sum up intelligent persistence by reading, gaining knowledge about, is there a good asset allocation mix if I am starting relatively early and I've got something like 20, 25, 30 or more years of working life ahead of me. And in my reading, there is the Bogle Financial Research Center set up by Vanguard Mutual, the Vanguard Group in the United States, where they do some very good research about how to make people invest better. What are good asset allocation programs? And one of their programs says that because equity in the long run is going to give you higher returns than a bond. It makes sense not to go 50-50, but if you have got, say, two decades or more to retirement, to go slightly more than 50 into equity and slightly less than 50 into bonds or debt or things like the PPF. How much? And they said that the optimum allocation is a 60-40 allocation, 60% 60 in equity, 40% in debt. So if you do that, what happens is our previous example where I'd given you that 11% equal, you slightly push it up to about 11.6% in the example that we are taking. This is your end corpus. This is your end corpus. You would have got 1.4 in a pure PPF, something like 3.2, 3.3 in a 50-50 mix. And just by going this without taking too much more risk, in a 60-40, 60 equity, 40 debt combination for 50 years, 50,000 being invested, that is 20,000 into PPF, 30,000 into equity for a period of 40 years. This is what your end corpus would look like. So intelligent persistence, intelligent persistence is what you require when you go into equity. Burton Malkiel says, persistent saving in regular amounts, no matter how small pays off. Persistent saving in regular amounts, no matter how small pays off. Systematic investment. 
if your distributor is no, has not used the word systematic investment or SIP at least once in the initial two or three meetings that he, has, he or she has had with you, you have to change the distributor. You will have come across articles or you will come across articles, let me caution you about that also, in the newspapers that at times lump sum investments give you more than systematic investments. Systematic investment returns are not very impressive in this particular period, in that particular period. This is unfortunately written by financial journalists. The one thing you should never read is any article by the normal financial journalist who reads, who writes in, in newspapers. They are writing there because they haven't a clue about what investment and finance is all about. And uh, if there's something worse you can do, it is watch a channel like CNBC. There's an author called Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He says, the best way to watch CNBC is with the volume kept to zero. So that their facial contortions are entertaining, but you don't make the mistake of listening to any of their so-called advice. Systematic investment is the best ever strategy invented for investment. And it is nothing new. We have heard of the age-old recurring deposit. That is a bad example of systematic investment because systematic investment is not created for or is not effective when the rate of return is known and it is the same. So if you are going in for a recurring deposit of 8%, you know it is 8%. Systematic uh, investment is most effective when the asset price fluctuates. When the asset price fluctuates. That is where you get the best out of systematic investment. Let us go to an example and before that, Anthony Gallia, who is a portfolio manager, who was at least, he says, investing is a strange business. It's the only one we know of where the, most ex where the more expensive the products get, the more customers want to buy them. 30,000 index, 29,000 index, everybody wants to buy equity. I'm investing in the market now. Why? Because it's up. I say, I always ask the question, land was 20 lakhs percent in a particular area, today it is 30 lakhs percent. When would you be happier buying it? You mean, uh, 20 lakhs percent. Index is, was 20,000, index is 30,000. When should you be happier when you're buying it? Now, if you cannot time the market and you should not time the market and nobody and I'm the first person to admit that I cannot time the market, eliminate the whole process of timing by a systematic investment which is a self-timer. It times by itself and times it effectively. If you want to understand the power of systematic investment, let's take an example. We'll take a normal investment versus a systematic investment and we'll take the stock market as an example. What does a normal stock market investor do? There is a stock quoting 100 rupees in the stock market. I believe this is a good stock. I decide to buy 100 shares investing 10,000 rupees. Unfortunately, I have bought it at the very peak of the market. From the day I buy, the market collapses, the stock price also collapses. It falls from 100 rupees to 70 rupees. Now, I am not a speculator. A speculator would panic and sell. I am a good, solid investor. What is my argument now? My argument is, I considered the stock very attractive at 100 rupees, therefore I bought it. So at 70 rupees, I am getting a discount. I will buy again. I have another 100. Now, the economy, let's say, is going into a long recession, two, three, four years. Everything is down. Companies are making losses. But I am an investor. I am getting the company's annual reports. I find that company's profitability has come down very badly, but in a recession also it is making some profits, it is paying some dividend. Now my argument is, if this is so, let me look at the stock price. And I find the stock price has come to 40 rupees. Although I bought it first at 100, now it is 40. The fact that in a bad recession, it is still reasonably profitable, I think if the economy turns, when the economy turns, the stock will do much better. 
So I buy my third hundred at 40 rupees. And when I do my final mathematics, I find myself holding 300 stocks, having paid a total of 21,000 rupees for these stocks, or holding 300 stocks at an average of 70 rupees per stock. This is what a normal investor would do. A speculator would buy with great fanfare here, sell in a panic here. This is an investor. Now, what a good investor would do, let's see whether a systematic investment can make it better. When you are an investor, your focus is generally on number of stocks. Buy 50 LNT, sell 25 Randbacks, buy 75 State Bank of India. This is the kind of uh, orders we give our, our stockbrokers. In a systematic investment, there is a shift of focus from numbers to equal amounts. If I am to convert this into a systematic investment, I made three purchases here. Total amount invested was 21,000. I am going to invest 21,000 also in the systematic investment, but I am going to invest it not on number of stocks, in terms of amount 7,000, 7,000, 7,000. This is how an SIP works. Rest of the example is absolutely the same. I invest my first 7,000 when the market rate is 100 rupees. That is as many stocks as I can buy for 7,000 rupees, I buy, I end up with 70 stocks. Next I buy when the fall is to 70 rupees, I can buy 100 stocks for 7,000 rupees. My third purchase is at 40 rupees, I can buy 175 stocks. Now when I do my mathematics, my total is 345 stocks, not 300 stocks. And when I do my average, it is 345 stocks at an average of about 61 rupees. Without trying, in the background, when you are not even aware of it. If any of you are SIP investors, and you have been SIP investors for at least three years, do a simple calculation. Ask your distributor for a detailed statement of account. Detailed statement of account. Through that statement of account, let's say 36 entries are there for three years. Take the highest NAV at which you purchased the units, take the lowest NAV, divide by two, arrive at the average. Then take the money you have put in, divided by the number of the units, you'll get this figure. 100% of the cases, no exceptions, you'll find that your price is less than the average price. 100%, it has to work. You will always, a systematic investor will always find that your actual price is lower than the market price. If your distributor is the kind who will guide you into systematic transfer plans, into systematic investment plans, you are with someone good. And like I said, like George Soros said, forget about me, good investment is boring. It is boring. But it works. And it works for you. It does not work against you. It converts all our hype and sentiment into ground reality. What do we do in real life? 50% discount, we rush to buy. Here's the discount, you're buying more. Prices are very high, you're buying less. And all this is happening, the beauty of this is, this is happening without you even being aware of it. You're not even aware of it. You need not be aware of it. The best investments are not just boring, the best investments are always on autopilot. Investments should not interfere with your daily routine, your work, your life. Investments should not take over your mind. You should have a free and comfortable mind. And you should do your work, be economically productive, earn your money. Investment should be a comfortable experience, a comfortable experience. And if your advisor is hell increasing the comfort level that you have with investments, they are doing something right. Systematic investment automatically enables right pricing. Systematic investment makes investment a habit. It's very good to cultivate these kind of habits. There's a beautiful old saying in investment, if you work on an investment, it will work for you. And the best way to work on an investment is keep on investing throughout your working life. Keep on investing systematically. Invest in good 
uh, avenues of investment like the stock market, like real estate, where prices fluctuate. Real estate, of course, systematic investment is not possible unless someday in India we have good real estate mutual funds, then it would be possible. If you work on an investment, it will work for you. The ultimate objective of good investing is to obtain above average returns at below average risk. And systematic investment is one of the best ways you can achieve this. Above average returns at below average risk. Your price will always be to your advantage. It will be less than average. So the moment you are buying something long term cheaper, automatically risk is lower, returns will be higher. Another point. When we dealt with persistence and intelligent persistence, you can turn around and ask me a question. Why take a risk? Why can't we put everything in the PPF? You yourself said, you yourself said that somebody who invests just 50,000 rupees, 8% in the PPF, 40 years, 1.4 crores. If they were retiring today, probably 1.4 crores would be enough. Why should we take a risk in order to earn a higher return? Simply because we do not know how much we will need in retirement. Sometimes figures can be very, very high. Came across a case recently of a a lady who had to undergo a bone marrow transplant for cancer. She is out of the disease now, but the cost was 60 lakh rupees. Now if somebody retires with 1.4 crores and they have got another 20 years of life ahead of them, 1.4 minus 60 lakhs like this, wouldn't it be better to have something like 3.5, 3.8, where 60 lakhs does not make a difference? that much of difference. No amount may be enough, but when you are faced with a crisis, isn't 3.5 better than 1.4? That's my question. That is why we should always remember that over very long periods, even a small difference, if you can push that 8% of the PPF up to 10% by a mix, you are doing a marvelous job. Just look at this example. I invest, now this is not systematic. I invest one lump sum, one lakh rupees, at 10% return for 40 years. One lakh, then I do nothing about it, but I get a 10% return compounded for 40 years, I end up with 45 lakhs. If the return goes to just 11%, the figure is something else, 65. And if I just go one more percentage point, we'll not take it 10 and 15, 10 and 12, Look at the end corpus, 93. Now I invite your attention to the difference between 93 and 45, little more than double. But to achieve little more than double at the end, the difference in the return that you had to get was only 2%. So we need not take huge risks. We need not take huge risks. When in doubt, go for a 50-50 balance. If you have the resources that can invest between bonds, stocks and real estate, one third, one third, one third, Talmud, 3000 years, no problem. The fact that I'm quoting it today after 3000 years means that it has stood the test of time. It has stood the test of time. But everything only in uh, uh, stocks, everything only in bonds, everything only in real estate, there could be unforeseen occurrences to a particular asset class that may work to your disadvantage.